Welcome back. Earlier today, the core PPI was reported on a month-over-month -month basis to have declined 0.03% to the downside. This is the first decline we've seen since March. We know the CPI report showed us a very big decline in inflation as well. Uh, we're going to talk about exactly what that means for the markets. On a month-over-month -month basis, left-hand side, PPI, producer price index, down 0.46%, year-over-year up 1.35, which is a very shallow number. Core PPI, which excludes food and energy, which are more volatile components of the inflation report, month-over-month, -month, down 0.03%, year-over-year, up only 2.45%. The yellow line represents PBI. These are the prices that the producers pay for raw materials. Uh, and the core PBI excludes food and energy. Both lines have moved to the downside. A real remarkable move to the downside in the PBI, which includes food and fuel. Specifically, the CPI report yesterday showed us a very significant decline in energy prices. And that decline in energy prices may have you know, save the Federal Reserve to an extent. Uh, the core PPI on a month-over-month -month basis, that's in red. The PPI, the standard figure in white, that is the lowest low we've seen going all the way back down to the uh, COVID crisis, really, of 2020. This is a very big decline in inflationary pressures. Here we see the white histogram bars. That represents the federal funds rate. The PPI in yellow, CPI, consumer price index in red, and both lines skyrocketed to the upside as a result of those very low inflation, uh, not inflation, but the very low interest rates. Those low interest rates created this inflation. Ironically, maybe not so ironically, we seem to hit a top on these inflation numbers right around June of 22, which represents the beginning of the inverted bond market, uh, which is something we talked about a lot you know, here over the past couple months. But as the Federal Reserve has raised interest rates, it looks like they've been quite successful at keeping inflation at bay. Of course, we have a 2% target. And notice the CPI, it's still above 2%. The prices for consumers have gone, or producers have gone down. The consumers, they're going down, but not enough yet. Not enough for the Federal Reserve to take uh, raising interest rates off the table. Of course, the futures market, you know, we talked about this yesterday, they'd see a different story. If you haven't seen our CPI report yesterday, please have a look. We talk about how the futures market really moved dramatically. Here in white, core CPI, consumer price index. In green, core PPI, producer price index. Now, the white and the green exclude food and energy. Including food and energy, we have the yellow line, producer price index, and the red line, CPI, consumer price index. Notice during the height of the inflationary era of 22, the PPI, the producer price index on a year-over-year -year basis, was the highest. The producers are paying the most. But now that inflation seems to be declining, this really is now the weakest of the four measures. Interesting how the producer prices seem to be the most volatile component. They seem to be most l closely linked to you know, commodities, uh, which they really depend on. Here's PPI on a year-over-year -year basis in yellow. Crude oil in red, a very strong correlation. Of course, this PPI number was calculated at the time that crude oil was down $75 a barrel. Since then, it has recovered. Will the PPI the next month reflect that recovery, that, inc that, that increase in, uh, in crude oil? That'll love to be seen. But the, you know, there's a very strong correlation, nevertheless. Here we see a PPI minus CPI, and we spoke about this yesterday. It's a very interesting correlation. Now, we know PPI is producer price index, the cost of goods and materials for the wholesalers, the raw materials they purchase. The CPI, consumer price index, are the prices that we pay as consumers. Now, if you take PPI minus CPI, meaning we want to see the excess cost that the producers pay, when that goes up, that seems to correlate very strongly with the S&P 500. But conversely, when the PPI comes down, then the S&P 500 goes down as well, the PPI versus the CPI. So it certainly seems that the S&P 500, in a sense, it's more closely linked to the excess prices 
that are that producers are paying, but not really that it's linked to the excess prices. It's basically it's linked to the discounts that the consumers pay. You see, as PPI goes up, as a good as the prices of goods, raw goods and raw materials that they use to make goods and services goes up, but the consumer still gets a discount, this red line goes up. And as a red line goes up, well, the white line, the S&P 500, tends to move in a similar fashion. So essentially, it's showing us that the S&P 500 is very closely linked to the consumer, more so than a producer. It makes sense. After all, we are driven, you know, where the U.S. economy is a consumer-driven economy, as opposed to you know, like uh, Japan, that is an export-driven economy. That's just the nature of of their economics. Uh, but nevertheless, will the S and P five hundred continue if the PPI minus CPI move to the downside? Will the S and P five hundred also move to the downside? We want to see if we are bear, are bullish on the stock market. If we think stocks are going to go up, we want to ensure that the customer. It's still getting a good discount from even if the premiums that the producers have to pay. Also, it's good for the Federal Reserve that oil prices have brought down PPI and CPI independently. But we also want to make sure these high interest rates have not hurt manufacturing too much or the jobs numbers. Last month's jobs numbers was not good. In this next in this week, uh Next couple of days, we have manufacturing numbers. Empire State Manufacturing in New York, Philly Fed as well. We want to make sure those numbers are not too weak uh, because then that would put uh, the Federal Reserve in a more difficult situation. Ideally, we want inflation to come down while jobs and manufacturing uh, still remain strong. Well, jobs aren't strong, but hopefully manufacturing will be. Stay tuned for those manufacturing numbers in the next day or so. We hope this has been helpful. We look forward to seeing you back soon.